But in studio right now, the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney, Katie wilkes Delegate. Good morning, Katie. Good morning. Notice I said your last name appropriately. You always do. <laughs> Drives me crazy when people don't say your name right. I can understand why you would feel that way. I do. I take it, I take it personally. I don't know how many times you've told people it's delegating. And Joe Kinzer, Joe, good morning to you. Good morning. Great to have you here with us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, you guys just concluded a grand jury? We did. Yeah, tell me about this. Uh, we had, I think, 83 indictments returned um, from this past grand jury. It's We meet three times a year, present the cases that are bound over for consideration for the grand jury's review and the um, grand jurors, it's 16 citizens, make a determination as to whether or not those cases should proceed on to circuit court um, and be tried or otherwise disposed of in circuit court, um, which you went right into the topic. I was really hoping for an opportunity to make a joke about how your program has been just trash recently. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean just recently? <laughs> but that was pretty good. I like. I was started with that too, <laughs> had I known. Yeah, she's here all week, folks. Tip your way. <laughs> but Joe, you better have a good opening line. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got to work on it. Just well, I, I brought Joe with me in part because you guys share a love of um, Pittsburgh sports teams. So I nice. figured if we needed something to talk about, um, he could he could fill the void. Are you from the Berg, Joe? I'm from Wheeling originally. Yeah. Um, so Berg adjacent. Nice. Close enough. Very good. Mr. Ferretti, also a Steeler fan. Yeah. yeah there so we the, go. we're going to give Katie five minutes and we're going to talk Pittsburgh. <laughs> <first. We'll talk laughs> go, Katie. Football. <laughs> But yes, we did. We so um, you said eighty three indictments. How yes. many of those were tied to one particular case? I we didn't have a big case like we did last term. The right. the February term we had a case with how many defendants? Many, many, <laughs> many. <laughs> several, many, the, several over a hundred counts, and it was I think like one hundred and fifty some counts and mm -hmm. like ten defendants. Um, we didn't have that this case. So for the most part, these were individual or uh, two or three defendants. Per indictment. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And the cases ranged from? In terms of... Uh, what kind of crimes? Anywhere from grand larceny to murder. We had one murder case that was indicted. And were most of, most of these cases local, or were some of them people from outside the area who came here and committed crimes? For this term, I would say um, most of them were local, I, I think. Most of them. I, I can remember off the top of my head maybe um, two or three that involved coming in from from out of state, you know, drug type cases, bringing stuff in from out of state. And how did this number of indictments compare to some previous grand juries? Is this about average, high, low, what? So it's, we were kind of joking about that because the way our um, grand jury is structured, we meet three times a year. It's the third Tuesday of February, May, and October. So between February and May, you have three months between May and October, you've got five. So ideally, if we could indict the largest number in May that we need to indict and have more time to try those cases, that would work out better. But it never seems to work that way because we indicted everything we needed to in February. And so we had a hundred some cases then and three months in which to try them if they uh, assert their speedy trial rights. And we had 80 some this time and five months to, to try them. So it's sort of a, um, a trying to figure out how to schedule things appropriately for you want you don't want a, any delay in indicting someone whose case is, is up for indictment, but also want to make sure that everybody who needs a trial date can get a trial date. It's, there's a lot of logistics that, mm -hmm. that go into this, especially with the number of courts that we have and judges hearing criminal cases and so um so it, it's i'd say it's about average are you completely post COVID in your operations and caught up on all the backlog and everything uh yes we actually just tried i think our last case that was pending pre-covid that, that was going to be a trial case um two weeks ago we had a a murder case that was a 2019 case that we we just tried and got that one handled joe talk a little bit about the process um once the grand jury returns uh, and, and, and recommends indictment, uh, at this point, what kind of discretion does your office have in terms of whether to go forward with that case or maybe go counter to what the grand jury has found? So if they return a true bill, um, the overwhelming majority of the time, we're going to be moving forward with exactly what they returned the true bill on. They, The grand jury has the ability to um, 
add counts or conduct their own investigations and then once it's returned they, there's been a probable cause finding that this this occurred um so uh i i don't know joe do you want to um since you're a little more front lines of getting the uh the cases talk a little bit about the process there sure so you know when we indict a case the the way it works in our office is the prosecutor who ultimately has it in circuit court after indictment was also the prosecutor who reviewed it and decided to present it to the grand jury in the first place so um, we try to keep that continuity with the case from as early on as possible and then at the end of the day the grand jury is is allowing the formal charge uh, that, that's what it is it's a formal charging document and it gets it in the right court where we can resolve it so we can resolve it by a jury trial if need be if we can't work something out most cases don't go to a trial most cases have some kind of resolution um, but the prosecutor who who decided to present that case once it's indicted then it's in it's in their discretion moving forward as to you know what kind of offers to make and in consultation with officers and victims if there's any victims and stuff like that um, but rarely um, rarely is there a situation where we have someone who isn't the person who put together the case and presented the case to the grand jury rarely is it someone else who takes it thereafter sure and I imagine that prosecutor who's going before the grand jury and assigned that case is hoping that you know they're presenting it hoping they get the true bill sure. so they can proceed so sure. so it's probably a rare circumstance where your office might say well you know we've kind of reviewed what the grand jury found and some of the counts they returned and maybe we just don't want to go in that direction it's probably a rare occurrence when that happens. yes very rare okay. very rare Matt. there you go Matt Miller I was going to ask as far as the the growth of our area have we seen a growth in crime and a growth of those cases that a grand jury is looking at yes I, I think we we certainly have um, looking at the the numbers where I just had um, our assistant pull the filings as of this morning and we're on track to be um, the same or surpass the um, felony and misdemeanor filings uh, that we had last year so um, I think with you know any growth there's good and bad and that does include um, you know a, a lot of uh, we're, we're busy there's a lot of job <laughs> security um, speaking of which if anyone knows any attorneys interested in an assistant prosecutor position yes. we have uh, availability so Joe would you like to move back to the area <laughs> <laughs> switch sides <laughs> well is that the, uh, switching sides so much but I, I would such and such I'd be matter. starting from square one. I don't know anything about we'll train you. criminal justice. <laughs> <laughs> We've got great prosecutors who can train you up. Katie Wilkes, Delegate, Joe Kinzer in from the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Matt? So not only do you need attorneys, how about the system as a whole? Are, are we in a position where we need more judges in our eastern panhandle to be able to more expediently deal with these cases? Well, we're in the process of obtaining that. So um, we we will have another magistrate. We'll have mm -hmm. a seventh magistrate as of the, the next election. Um, I think last time I was on, we, we talked a little bit about where to put them, and that's something that hasn't fully been resolved by the county yet that we, we need to work on. Um, but the judiciary is continuing to, to grow to kind of adapt to our needs. Um, our My office has um, is, is growing some. Um, you know, we've seen uh, – lot of change in law enforcement the sheriff's department has um, really uh, they've been able to fill their positions they've they've been doing a great job which I think to some extent um, is reflected in the numbers that we see because they're very proactive and so we're um, getting their their cases and um, so to I guess answer your question um, I think that most parts of the system are growing to accommodate you know what's needed with the growth in the area I believe earlier you mentioned 16 citizens are part of that, that grand jury. Is yes. that a, a simple selection just like any other jury selection? I know October of 21, right in the middle of football season and everything mm -hmm. going on, um, you know, I, I, I got that letter in the mail and every day I was making that call to see if I would come in. I could have been a part of that October grand jury as opposed to maybe dealing with just an individual case. The process for selecting the jurors is the same, but you don't have to call in like that if you're okay. selected for grand jury, that it's just the the three times a month. Um, but in or terms a of a, de or a year, um, in terms of identifying um, who's going to be the grand jurors, um, it's conducted similarly to um, choosing what we call a pettit jury or a trial okay. jury. 
But but the letter that I would get, would it tell me that I was calling to be a part of the grand jury or I I've never actually seen the okay. letter, but All right. um that's my that's my understanding. All right. So that way you know it was you don't have to call in, you have a specific day that you have to show up. Katie, uh, Jeff Haddock's on our Facebook comment section uh, noted that he saw four different indictments against parents for sexual abuse of their children involved in this grand jury? Uh, yes, yes. That, that sounds right. Uh, and you wanted to know that seems like an extraordinarily high number for a single grand jury seating, is that correct? I, I wish that were an extraordinarily high number. Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, out of our last grand jury in February, you had at least two of those cases, right? Yes. So yeah. I, I would say, unfortunately, no, I don't think so. It's, oh, that's terrible. It is. Um, and, you know, the way Katie described with grand jury, you know, a lot of times it's just it's just logistical as to mm -hmm. when a case gets indicted. Um, but uh, but, yeah, unfortunately, I I don't think that that's a, a particularly high number. Uh, there was a question, and I think we probably have to straighten this out every time that you're on, Katie, and had to do with uh, the investigation of Sheriff Harmon. Again, that does not involve your office. That is correct. That is Morgan County that is handling that. Is there any communication between your office and their office while that's going on? No. Um, essentially, that's the, the point of having the special prosecutor is that it's completely cut off. Um, and, you know, we see that from the other side, too, when we have to handle special prosecutor appointments for other counties. It's just you kind of uh, get a file and then it's it's yours. Yeah, uh, I, I brought that up. Um, because when I do talk to you, it's inevitable. I get a text that says, ask her about the Sheriff Harmon <laughs> investigation. I go. <sighs> <laughs> It's not our office. You you are correct. We still we, we do get you know occasional calls about that, and that's that's not us. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this question because this also comes up. I want to revisit it once again when and we can look at the Sheriff Harmon situation. We can look at the Elaine Mock situation uh, as to why the county's prosecuting attorneys, regardless of the county, don't tend to take on those cases themselves. Why is that? Uh, there are ethical rules that, uh, depending on what type of case it is, may prohibit us. Um, there's we're as prosecutors in a quasi judicial role and held to uh, a higher standard generally than just than practicing other practicing attorneys in terms of when a conflict might arise or when there might be the appearance of a conflict. So um, oftentimes in cases like that, the I think safer course ethically um, is to request a special prosecutor to handle it. And when you do that, you don't pick who tries the case. There's that, a process for that that's out of your hands. That's correct. We make the uh, motion for special prosecutor. It's uh, assigned by someone in Charleston who picks another county, and um, then a judge enters an order appointing them. Is Berkeley County currently acting as a special prosecutor at this moment for other counties? Yes. yes. Yeah. Do you know what the count would be on that, roughly? There's always a, a handful of them um, at any given time. I would say probably three or four. Are they um, are they mostly neighboring Eastern Panhandle counties? Do you ever get assigned further away? I believe we've only had Morgan and Jefferson. Um, you know, to people from Charleston, they think that the Panhandle is on an island unto itself. So <laughs> everything sort of gets assigned within the the Panhandle for the most part. Back to you, Joe. Katie, I know there's a. I believe I shouldn't say I know, but I believe there's a association of state prosecuting or county prosecutors yes. that you belong to yes. so on occasion you get together with prosecutors from other counties in the state and you kind of compare notes uh, in terms of this criminal justice system uh, is there where, is there any place where what Berkeley County is an outlier in terms of maybe the number of crimes maybe staffing issues maybe number of judges you, you have or need anywhere that you, when you compare Berkeley County to other parts of the state where you think we're, we're different and areas that we might need to, to give attention to, to to fix that that's an interesting question and something i think that we see a lot so we have um we meet twice a year we have a conference of um, prosecutors and it's mostly continuing education but it gives us the opportunity to talk with other prosecutors and uh, i think certainly you know we're pretty similarly situated as montegalia county or um you know harrison or even Kanawha and Cabell, but to talk to uh, some of the prosecutors from smaller counties can can be can be pretty fascinating. Um, uh, not not so much that we're different in a way that we or they need improvement, just that they're not seeing the same things we are. Like, uh, do you want to 
talk about the um, the DNA. Right. Uh, we we were at a conference um, where I believe we were getting continuing education regarding you know updates and DNA testing and and what our lab can do and and that kind of stuff. And and one of the elected prosecutors from another smaller county um, said something along the lines of you know I've I've never had a DNA case ever you know and um, that's that's not what we deal with up here. We deal with a, a different world. <laughs> yeah, completely different world. Mm. Um, and that's that's really what I take away when I speak to the other counties. Like Katie said, there are some that are similar to us, um, but especially here on, on 81 and, and Berkeley County specifically, I think we deal with a lot of things before the other counties. We, mm. we see the trends starting mm -hmm. uh, as far as crime. And um, the other prosecutors at the conference, they they like to pick our brains about it and ask about what's going on and if we think there's going to, you know, have a ripple effect and, and come to their counties as well. Is that because the proximity to Baltimore and Washington? I, I mean, I, I certainly think, yes, well, 81 and, and our proximity to, to those larger cities is far, far different from, you know, say, Clay County in West Virginia. It's, it's a whole other world. So, Matt? I was just thinking that that very thought of, of I-81 and, and what influence that may have on crime here in the eastern panhandle. Is there a way to track that or trace that and say a, a lot of it is coming because of easy access? I would think that would be something that could be traced. It's not something that is currently tracked mm -hmm. to my knowledge, um, but I can say there certainly are, um, you know, a number of cases we see uh, drugs and otherwise. Mm -hmm. the, we've had um, three murder trials this year. The second one that we had was, I think maybe I talked about it last time I was here, a trucker murder that happened literally on the, the shoulder of 81. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't have numbers, but I certainly think that is, um, that is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, human trafficking, uh, it, was that involved in any of your indictments in the last grand jury? No. No, we didn't have any cases that were um, brought to us by law enforcement that had human trafficking as an element, to my knowledge. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Does that indicate an improvement in fighting that, or is it just that maybe we just weren't reported? I, I think it's certainly out there and something that is very difficult to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of the times, if it is... Um, across state lines it's something that's going to be handled at the federal level so we won't see it um but i i think yeah I, a, a good you could say it's a good thing but i i would be more concerned that it's that it's out there but not able to be investigated in a way that brings it to us to to try are there uh, larger multi-jurisdictional multi-agency investigations going on right now in the eastern panhandle that you are aware of and are allowed to admit to. <laughs> <laughs> Pertaining to what specifically? Human trafficking or anything at all? Anything at all. There's always, oh, yeah. Yeah. there's always. Oh, yeah. Joe, Joe, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have, we have a, a really great task force and they are always, um, you know, investigating multi-jurisdictional things. I'll put it that way. Uh, the governor proposed $250 million for improvements and the consolidation of uh, a crime lab and, and other um, items that I know you folks would be using on a regular basis. And I think the legislature pro approved $125 million of that this uh, particular term. Uh, how would something like that help and assist your investigations? So I... Joe's already smiling. He's like, yeah. I, I just... The, the lab... Uh, the state police crime lab is an incredible partner for us. Like we cannot do much of what we do in, especially in big cases without them. And we have a great relationship with that lab. Um, we were permitted to be in a, a pilot program for like uh, information sharing with them so that we could access um, certain records on our own from our office. Um, but any help or assistance that they could get, I mean, it's one lab for the whole state. Um, so, any additional resources they can have will will only help us in the end, I think. But to, to follow up on that also, um, not just the, the crime lab, I, um, I tuned in in the middle of uh, Senator Blair talking about um, the medical examiner's office recently, and I meant to follow up with him on that, and I haven't. That, they, they need help. Yes. They, they need a lot of help. Um, a lot of what we deal with is delays in, in getting autopsies, or then, 
there's so much uh, turnover with the medical examiners that it's difficult to um, for that medical examiner who did the autopsy and the report to be available to testify. So we've had of the three murder cases we had this year, we only had a um, you know forensic medical examiner available to testify in one of them. Wow. So we've had to sort of make do and call a lot of other witnesses we normally wouldn't call um, to to establish cause of death, whereas normally we just have the medical examiner come in and testify about the autopsy. So that's that's a real challenge and something that I think more resources could assist with. Is that a post-COVID generated shortage or was it like that even before? I, I think it was, I, I don't think that's necessarily attributable to COVID. I think it's the, you know, the I don't know why they have a hard time attracting and retaining um, medical examiners, but I, to my knowledge, it's it's gone on for a while. Yeah, who wouldn't want to carve into dead bodies all day? <laughs> right, long, I was thinking it. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna say it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. it that <laughs> that's a day right there. Yeah. It's probably yeah. probably part of it. Um, I know we're running short on time. I did want to Please. give a shout out to um, Senator Trump. I know he was on right before us and. Um, one of the the major challenges my office faces that we don't talk about a lot is um, dealing with the abuse and neglect docket and uh, the the status of the Department of Health and Human Resources. And Senator Trump has been um, excellent at identifying, listening to our needs, identifying what's going on, and, and holding their feet to the fire. I mean, I think you you had a meeting with him. It's been a couple of years now. Yes. And he's really taken the the feedback he's gotten and. Um, worked to attempt to um, get some accountability there and, and get the resources that we need. Yeah, so we we have a minute thanks. or two if you wanted to get into more. We had Lane Deal on the show after the legislative session ended, and she did a great job of spelling out what some of the issues are when you're dealing with minors in the court system and foster care and, and, and that whole scenario there. But what are a couple of things that the state could do to improve that system, Katie or Joe? I mean, the overwhelming issue that we've had now for years um, where we keep saying I don't think it can get worse and then it does mm -hmm. is just the staffing with the department um, the department workers um, for CPS child you know child abuse investigations and the like um, they are some of the greatest people I've ever had the pleasure of working with um, but they get they get run out of town because they're so um, there's not enough of them, and they, they have so much trouble with turnover and keeping people long enough to become close to fully staffed that they just bring in new people, and unfortunately those people get burnt out very quickly, and then they leave, and that makes it that much harder for those few few and far between who have held on and stayed through uh, during the last couple of years. And um, if they were up to full staffing uh, for any amount of time, I, f I feel like you know it could really breathe new life into this system. But... It just doesn't seem to work out that way, although there's been fantastic efforts, specifically by Senator Trump, um, and uh, it's really helped out. But we're not we're not there yet, but it's getting better, so I'm told. Go ahead, Joe. I'm yeah, real quickly, uh, uh, while we're talking about state resources, uh, are you seeing more petitions for release from the cor local correctional facility because of conditions, health issues? Uh, you seeing people petitioning for bail rather than confinement while they're cases pending and and that some of the issues are citing are the conditions at the local jail because we we understand the staffing issue there too uh are you seeing that impacting some of your cases i don't know directly necessarily i mean i think that um bail reform has been a big topic for a couple of years now and so we're certainly you know making an effort to ensure that we're not incarcerating people who don't need to be um aside from the conditions i think certainly we we get letters um we get a lot of um handwritten letters from defendants talking about the the yeah. conditions in the jail but um i would say i don't know that we've gotten many that cite just the conditions as part of the reason why they should get out right e even if it's the marriott in there nobody wants to be in jail so they're always sure. asking to get out they're always asking for bond to be reduced or if their bond's been revoked for it to be reinstated um it seemed in my opinion i've just seen sometimes they'll they'll add that in their motion you know it'll be uh hey i want to do this or i think i should be able to be released now and also it's it's really bad in here you know, something like that at the end. Right. Um, I just wondered if there's your sense that it, 
it really is bad over there. Uh, I don't think it's good. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, I know it's not supposed to be, but sure. still, uh, you wonder if, if it's getting to the point where it's becoming a real concern. I think it's mostly staffed by guardsmen. Or, right? Yeah, National Guard. Or, yeah. 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 Hmm. I think it's a 54% vacancy rate at the ERJ and at the Vicki Douglas uh, Juvenile Detention Center, too. Katie Wilkes, Delegate, Joe Kenzer, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming in at 9.04.